In this tutorial, we're going to take a step away from talking about individual MOPS nodes and how to use them, and talk more broadly about how to use MOPS as a system alongside Vellum simulations. A lot of the most obvious use cases for MOPS has to do with instances in rigid body dynamics, but you can use the same MOPS tools to influence Vellum simulations as well with a little know-how. This tutorial is not meant to teach you how Vellum works from scratch. If you're totally new to Vellum, you should spend some time reading the documentation and watching SideFX's tutorial videos on how Vellum is meant to work. We're not going to be doing anything crazy advanced here, but it's important that you understand a little bit about the various attributes that the Vellum solver uses, things like constraint stiffness, rest length, and so on. All that said, let's start with a really simple example, using MOPS falloffs to modify the strength of Vellum constraints. Okay, starting from a new scene, let's drop down a geometry container and then put down our test geometry template body. Okay, so we're just gonna go with a really straightforward vellum cloth configuration. I'm just gonna wire this up here. It's not really anything special that we need to do for this. I'm gonna set the mass to uniform just to have it be a little bit more predictable, at least for this simulation. Then I'm gonna drop down a second constraint. And this constraint type is gonna be a pin uh, and we're gonna do a soft pin. So I'm gonna select pin to target and then wire up the geometry and constraints. I'm going to connect the template body into the third input because it wants to pin to itself. I'm going to set the pin type from permanent to soft, and this is going to let me adjust the stiffness of it as an attribute. I'm going to set the stiffness all the way to zero. And then the last thing I want to do is under the stretch group here, I want an output group, and I'm going to call this pin. And this is so that I can address these constraints specifically inside the solver. That's basically everything. So now I'm going to drop down a vellum solver. and wire up the first two here. I don't need the third input because I'm not actually going to be colliding with anything other than the ground plane. So if I play this sim... Oh, okay, so it looks like he's not actually colliding with the ground plane just yet, so let's make sure we've got that on. Check this on. Okay, and he just turns into mush, which is pretty much what we expected because our pin stiffness is zero and the cloth configuration is a very sort of loose cloth that doesn't really have any stiffness in it. So now what we need to do is adjust the strength of those pins based on a fall off and we're going to do that inside the vellum solver. So uh, I'm going to highlight force here so we can see the results of this thing and then I'm going to drop down a mops shape fall off. And this is the DOP version, it's inside the solver. Now, there's a number of different ways that I could go about modulating the constraint here, but the, the most straightforward way for what we're doing here is to just change the falloff attribute to be stiffness. And this is an, a, a primitive attribute that needs to be on the constraints themselves. And in newer versions of MOPS Plus, uh, there's a very convenient way to target constraints, and that's to go to the initialize tab here and then just set it to constraints. That's going to do two things. One, it's going to set it to run over primitives. So now we're binding to a primitive attribute, stiffness, which is the attribute on the constraints that we want to change. Uh, and the other thing it does is it sets the geometry data to constraint geometry, which is if you look in the spreadsheet here and we open up vellum object here, you have your geometry and this is like the actual guy here. And then you have collision geometry and that's the constraint primitives that you can't see here, but the constraint primitives are what are generated uh, by the vellum constraint SOPs. And if you look at the primitive uh, attributes list here and scroll across, that stiffness attribute is what we want to be messing with. And you can see that the distance constraints, uh, the stiffness of these things is all pretty high. But if we so sort by uh, type and we look at our pin constraints, you can see the stiffness is zero uh, because of the values that we set in SOPs. Anyways. Uh, what we want to do is we want to set the stiffness constraint to be between its current value, which is, you know, zero, to something significantly higher, strong enough for this thing to be uh, pinned so that he stands upright again. And to do that, I can go to the remap tab, because remember, falloffs by default want to set a range from zero to one. Uh, if I enable remapping and then set this to be zero to, let's say, 100, now I'm going to get uh, a maximum value of 100 when this, uh, this falloff actually goes across. And I want this to move from left to right, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of transforming here. Let's uh, go to the Shape tab and then hit Enter to get the manipulator. I'm just gonna rotate them this way. Let's just say negative 90 even. 
and then I'm going to start over here, well, uh, to the left of his hand here. I'm just going to disable update real quick so that I can scrub without actually solving. I want to say two seconds into the sim, so after he's settled down, I'm going to start moving. And then let's say by the two seconds after that, I want this to move all the way across. And so what this is going to do is as it sweeps across, it's going to blend all of the constraints from a stiffness of zero to a stiffness of 100 as it, as it sweeps across. The last thing I want to do is I only want to write to the stiffness of those specific pin constraints, right? I don't want to mess with the cloth constraint stiffness itself. So I'm going to make sure to uh, open up this group selector. And again, if you don't see this group selector, it's because you have an older version of MOPS Plus. Get the latest version and you'll have this selector here for your convenience. And I'm just going to grab pin because that's the group that I assigned to my pin constraints. And so now it's only going to modify the, the weights of those constraints. So if I hit play now, he's going to turn into mush because the fall off uh, hasn't moved yet. Okay, now the home simulation is run. I'm going to just set my end frame here to 120 so I can play this. And now when I play, you can see he turns to mush. This thing sweeps across and he's back to normal. Let's turn this to real time just so that it's a little bit slower. So you can see that as this sweeps across, the stiffness changes from zero to 100 and the pins activate. So really simple test case here, but this kind of shows you how you can bind directly to vellum attributes using a fall off. Now let's take this idea just a little further and use a simple expression to modify the rest length of vellum constraints using MOPS falloffs. Okay, so again, starting from a fresh scene, I'm gonna drop down a geometry container and then put down a sphere. And I'm gonna do this as just like a regular polygon mesh so we get all even triangles. Uh, vellum likes nice even triangulation better. You can pass it quads. Um, what it's going to do is internally triangulate your mesh uh, and then solve from there, um, which in some cases is totally fine. But if you want to be really uh, precise about how Vellum solves your uh, geometry, it's good to feed it um, triangles and as regular triangles as you can. Anyways, here's my sphere. I'm going to turn the frequency up to 15 so I get lots more triangles. And then straight to Vellum configure cloth. Uh, I don't really need to change much about the Vellum Configure cloth here. I think the defaults here are probably fine for this example. Um, and note that for the stretch constraints, I have an output group already called stretch, and I'm going to be using this in the solver. So let's just go straight to a Vellum solver sop. For this example, on the solver, I'm actually going to disable gravity. So I'm going to go to the Forces tab and just turn this off completely. And other than that, I'm just going to leave this as is, and we'll just go right into the solver. So again, I'm going to highlight the force output here. And then what I want to do is uh, create a MOPS noise falloff. Now, again, because I'm modifying the rest length of constraints, that's the goal here, is to have the constraints grow or shrink based on the noise falloff, I am going to set this to constraints. So that, again, that sets the geometry data to constraint geometry. If you're on an older version of MOPS, you'll have to do that manually, and then sets it to run over primitives because uh, what we're going to be editing is a primitive attribute. Um, for the group, I'm going to pick stretch. I don't really want to modify the bend rest length. That could get weird. I only want to change the stretchiness of the constraints to make them sort of inflate or deflate as the noise uh, fall off animates through it. So before I get to actually writing to these values, what I want to do is actually set my noise attributes. I'll stick with Perlin noise, but I'm going to go with a frequency of about 0.5, which is I just already know is the right size for the scene. And I'm going to set it to time varying so that the noise evolves over time. The only other thing I want to do is uh, under the remapping tab, um, what I'm going to be writing to is the relative rest length of the constraint, basically the scale of each constraint uh, according to how it originally uh, comes into the simulation. Um, to explain it a little better, if I go to the Vellum Object tab and click on Constraint Geometry and look at my primitive attributes here, you can see that the primitives are automatically given two attributes here. You have rest length and you have rest length or ridge. Rest length is the current rest length of each constraint. So that's literally just the, the length or the perimeter of each primitive segment. Rest length or ridge is an attribute that's computed once uh, when the constraint is generated and that uh, never changes, or at least in normal simulation, it'll never change. That's the, the length of the constraint when the sim starts uh, in SOPS. The rest length is uh, also an absolute value, and by default, they're going to be the same, but you can change the rest length 
uh, during the simulation. The reason why these two are really useful is because you can use the, the ratio of these two is essentially the rest length scale. If you've ever used a vellum constraint properties dot, you might have seen that there's a rest length scale parameter that you can change, and that rest length scale is, uh, they call it rest scale here. Rest length scale isn't an attribute here though. It's not in the spreadsheet. When you change it uh, by activating this and then setting it in an expression or just using the slider here, what it's doing is comparing the rest, the original rest length and the current one, and it's computing a rest length based on the scale that you want. So it's literally just multiplying this value by rest length of ridge, and that's your final rest length. Just a little aside there, because what you can't do is write directly to like rest length scale. It's not a real attribute. It doesn't actually exist. Um, anyways, what I'm going to do is I, I, I still want to uh, conceive of this as scale because it's just easier to think about rather than computing absolute values. I want to be scaling these constraints between one value and another value. So what I want to do is I want the minimum length to be one because I don't want these things to shrink much smaller than the other, either they already are. And I'm going to set the maximum to two. So when the noise value is at its highest, the, the length of each one of these individual primitives uh, will double. And then I'm just going to set this, uh, this is just based on earlier tests, because the noise functions um, don't always write out like a clean zero to one range, every noise function is different. I'm going to set the input maximum to 0.6, and that means that uh, the it, we're going to get more high values for the noise in here. It's like doing a levels adjustment. So now that that's done, the only thing left to do is to figure out how to actually take this fall off attribute and apply it to the rest length uh, scale of these individual primitives. And we're going to do that with an expression. This is really convenient. It means that we don't have to do a separate vellum constraint properties node. We can just write directly to that attribute from here. So what I'm going to do, and you can even see that in the comments here that I've written for like the default values of expression, we can write to uh, rest length, which is this property right here. And we're doing it based on the fall off attribute. Right, So the local variable falloff is a property of each of these MOPS constraints, and you can just use that directly uh, to write to whatever you want. So in this case, I can just uncomment this line. And rest length, which again is this property right here, is going to be equal to the falloff value, and that local variable is exposed to you. That's, uh, that's what this means. Um, times the original rest length. So I'm going to be scaling this by this one to two range. And that's really all I have to do. If I play this, you can see that it starts to inflate and then does all this wild stuff as it kind of uh, reorganizes itself. But it's using that uh, noise and then scaling the individual primitives based on that function. To better visualize it, if you want, we can go out to the geometry tab. And you can see if we look at our, if we drop this down to constraint geometry and look at our properties, we are getting or should be getting a fall off value here. And we have to go to the second frame where it actually starts writing. So this is our effectively our scale that we're applying. So if we want to visualize this, what we can do is uh, transfer this from the constraints to the points. So this is actually going to bring it across to the the not the points, but the primitives, because it is a primitive attribute. And now I'm going to promote this to points. So from primitive to point, average is fine. We're going to do mops fall off here. And then I'm going to remap this, because right now the fall off value is going from between 1 and 2, and I want it to be to a more uh, normalized range. I'm just going to pick my maximum at 2, and then, re uh, sorry, 1 to 2. Yeah, and then we'll remap that to 0 to 1. So let me just sanity check my values here and make sure that this is right. If I click on my point view here and look at the MOPS value, value that I'm transferring across, this actually looks like it's mostly very low. So maybe what I want to do is 0 to 2. Yeah, that looks better. And in fact, I might uh, bring this down a bit just so I'm getting more slightly hotter values that'll be easier for visualization. Now I can just drop down a MOPS color modifier just for a quick and easy visualization. So this is giving us roughly a visualization of where the constraints are puffing out and when they're suck where they're sucking in, where they're shrinking.
And that's really it. I mean, we can go back in here and we can adjust the frequency of this noise. Maybe we want this to be a higher frequency. And if we go back out here, you're going to see that also reflected in the visualization. You're going to get much more chaotic wrinkling happening. So again, the important thing to remember here is that by using Vexpressions this way under the falloff tab, you can write to whatever falloff attribute you want or at whatever constraint attribute you want, but you can then uh, modulate this in really interesting ways and use this for trickier attributes like rest length or ridge, uh, which is not, uh, rest length or ridge is an attribute, but rest length scale is not. So when scaling the rest length of constraints, it's often easier to, to think of it this way as being like a scaling factor on something. Um, and doing it this way means that you don't have to actually go and open up a vellum constraint properties dot to do the same thing, to like bring it here, enable wrestling scale, creative expression, and then write something out that uses mops fall off and writes to rest scale. We can skip this step entirely and save ourselves uh, a few milliseconds per frame. So far, we've been using falloffs and dops to animate vellum properties, but it's possible and often faster and easier to use falloffs and sops and then import those animated values into dops. Remember that when doing simulations, you're only setting initial conditions. If an attribute changes in sops and you want this to be reflected in dops, you have to import those values yourself. Fortunately, this is made easier with another mops node, the fetch attribute dop. Okay, so for this example, in the interest of time, I'm not going to step-by-step -step build out the entire network from scratch with you because a lot of it's just basic SOPs work. Um, this example is the vellum rest length.hip example, which uh, again is in the most recent version of MOPS. And I'm just gonna really quickly step through what's going on in here from the beginning. I'm starting with a straight line. I'm resampling it to get more points. Then I'm running it through a MOPS noise modifier just to jitter it a bit. And then I'm copying this sphere to those points to get just kind of this mess of spheres just to start with like an interesting shape. Really nothing fancy about this. I'm converting this to VDBs um, to kind of blur it all together and then converting that back to polygons. And this is just to turn this into one solid shell. I'm remeshing um, so that I have regular triangles here. Uh, and they're pretty small because I want to be able to get uh, some high details on this. And then I'm just running this through an attribute blur uh, to sort of smooth out these points to get rid of um, you can see that you can see the faceting on the source geometry here because of the way it was constructed. This just smoothed out all those details. So now I have this, you know, smooth, weird blob shape. It'll be an interesting one for the purposes of this sim. The next thing to do is uh, to drop down vellum cloth. Really, again, not doing anything fancy here at all. This is just the default settings. I don't need to do anything else here. Um, I have my output group for stretch constraints, and that's what I'm going to be modifying here is, again, I'm going to be changing the rest length of constraints. So from here, what I want to do is kind of have, you know, if you remember what this animation looks like, it's going to start bulging out from the bottom up into kind of this weird wrinkly pattern. The way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to start with a spread fall off. Um, and this is just one of the built in fall off nodes that we've always had. Um, and what I'm going to do is set it to point cloud mode. And the reason I'm doing it this way is so that I'm not dependent on the topology of this thing uh, to, to determine where I want the fall off to start. I know I want it to start at the bottom and work its way up. So the way that I can do that is just by creating an arbitrary point in space. So I've just made this point down here. And then I'm in point cloud mode for the mops fall off. And that means that it's just going to start from the nearest points that it can find relative to where this point is in space. Uh, I'm going to turn on preview fall off so we can see this a little bit more clearly. Um, this is in connectivity mode. Um, because these constraints are pretty dense, I don't have to worry about any points being outside of the realm of connectivity. Um, newer versions of spread falloff will warn you if any points are outside of the spread radius so that you know what to expect. Um, if points are outside the spread radius, they're just going to be ignored. Uh, and I don't want that to happen here. So anyways, with these settings, it's basically just going to work by default. I am adding a little bit of noise in here just to make the pattern uh, less regular. And you can see I'm animating between frame zero and 96. I'm just spreading from that point and then working my way up towards the top of the shape. So that's just the built-in noise that I've applied here. Now, the end result here is that everything is white. So everything has a fully maxed out falloff value. And in this case, that's not what I want because I want to get that kind of 
you know, interesting organic pattern here. So I'm doing a second fall off here. This is a noise fall off that I'm applying. And I'm applying this uh, in multiply mode. And if I preview this, what you can see is now I'm getting this kind of wild leopard print pattern. And this is just multiplied against the original spread fall off that I did. So I can break up that pattern a bit uh, and get much more interesting results when I finally inflate these constraints based on this value. Uh, and the next thing I'm doing here, it's it's really just the same thing. I'm doing another noise fall off in multiply mode to again break up this pattern so that I have multiple frequencies of noise here. Um, it's just going to make the overall pattern more interesting. A lot of the time when you're doing any kind of texturing or layering of effects here, you want to have you don't want all your details to be the same frequency. It, it'll look more artificial that way. So this way I have areas that are going to bulge out quite a lot and bulge out in interesting shapes and other areas that are going to stay kind of sucked in and it's going to create for a more visually interesting and contrasting shape. The next thing that I want to do is, um, because again, I want this to be modifying rest length, right? Um, and so, or the, the scale of the rest length. And so I'm going to... Ch change this value from zero to one, which is like what fall off usually gives you, I'm going to remap that to be one to three. So um, the smallest that these constraints can get is going to be the same size that they are already. So these blue areas are going to stay as they are. And these large areas, these white areas here are going to expand to about three times their original size. Um, and then finally, because uh, mops fall offs in SOPs here are, all, are pretty much always going to be writing to point attributes. I want to promote this to a primitive attribute. So now if I go over here to my uh, primitives list on the constraints here, and again, I just want to show here, we are looking at the constraints. These are not the source uh, geometry points. These are the constraint primitives. I'm going to promote this to a prim attribute, and now we can use this directly um, in DOPS to modify the rest length of our constraints. Um, something that I should have said earlier, but it didn't point out, is that one of the, the reasons why we're doing this in SOPs instead of doing all of this falloff stuff on the DOPS end is because when you're setting up falloff nodes in DOPS, the way that we were in the previous examples, um, A, it's slower because you can't just quickly see the falloff animations uh, work by, while you scrub your timeline because these are all procedural. They're all very quick. The, uh, the other thing that you miss out on is that um, if we were doing something like a noise fall off or a shape fall off in DOPS, uh, and I've mentioned this in earlier tutorials, um, the the fall off pattern is going to be based on the current uh, shape of the object that you're working on at that time step, right? Instead of being able to sort of control it based on the shape uh, at rest, it's working on the live shape and that can make it a lot more unpredictable to work with. In some cases, it's exactly what you want. In this case, we're trying to sort of guide this shape uh, and the constraint length based on a static pose uh, so that we can more predictably decide what's going to inflate and what's not. In general, if you're working on a sim like this um, and you're, you're going for speed and efficiency and art directability, in most cases, it's better to try to do all of your falloffs and all of this extra grooming work in SOPs and then bring this information into DOPS rather than doing the fall off uh, or whatever manipulation you're doing in DOPS directly, because we can sort of art direct the timing and the pace and the shape of all of these things procedurally before we go into the simulation. But the, the mops DOPS fall offs are there for those situations where that's not what you want or you can't do it for whatever reason. Um, anyways, I'm gonna keep going, but I just wanted to point out why we're doing this in SOPs and why this is often what you're going to wanna be doing when you're art directing Vellum simulations. The next step here, uh, before we get to the end of the constraint section is I'm just throwing down an enumerate SOP. Um, and this is because of a quirk in the Vellum solver SOP. Um, the primitive order of your constraints is not guaranteed to say the same. So when we go to the vellum solver here, the, the actual order of these constraint primitives, the number of them could just change arbitrarily and you'll have no idea what they are until it's too late. Um, sorry, I'm gonna cancel this and just rewind a second here. Um, but the exact order of what these are probably will change. Um, you don't have any, over, any control over this. And so the way that we're gonna get around this is similar to what you do with particles. We're gonna assign an ID attribute to the primitives themselves so that even if the constraint order gets scrambled, we know exactly which primitive we're targeting and which primitive uh, 
is getting the fall off values that we want at each given time step. So that's the end of the constraint setup. Uh, we have our, our primitive attribute and we have an ID attribute uh, that we can use. So we're done there. On the left side here, what I'm doing is once I have this um, noise fall off, and this is before I remap it, right? This is the zero one value that we've calculated. What I want to do is also transfer this onto the geometry itself, just in case I need to use it later um, to have it as a point attribute. So I'm gonna transfer it across to the geometry so that I have it here. And if I look at the geometry uh, points here, you can see that I've got a fall off value spreading across. Uh, I might want that later, just uh, just in case. Um, so anyways, I'm gonna rewind here. And now let's go inside the VLM solver. So what do we need to do in here? We need to grab that updated fall off value from the constraints and then use that to drive some constraint property. Uh, in this case, it's rest length. So mops fetch attribute uh, is the easy way to do this. Um, what fetch attribute does is it grabs the attribute values from SOPs as they change and then writes those attributes to whatever attribute you want um, in your simulation here. So again, the initialize tab here is going to set you, uh, this is set to constraints. And what this does is it makes sure that you're running over primitives and that you're running over, if I go to the input tab here, you're running over constraint geometry. And the source geometry, it's very important to set this here, um, is set to a SOP, and that SOP is that constraints null that we defined here. One thing that you should be aware of here is that when you're dealing with geometry wrangles, and that's what fetch attribute is based on, you have the ability to set you know, first context geometry, second context geometry, whatever. Um, the problem with using these flags is that the inputs that they're talking about here as the first, second, third, whatever context geometries are not these inputs. What they are are the inputs to the dop net here. So if you were to actually go into the vellum solver here, it's these inputs, which you don't normally interact with when you're using the vellum solver SOP. So they're not generally safe to rely on when you're trying to pick your source geometry here, I would recommend just setting it to explicitly to a SOP and then pathing to it here. It's the most guaranteed way to go through because um, just the, the, the inputs aren't what you think they are. Um, back to the attribute tab, I'm again, I'm reading MOPS fall off from the constraint prim primitives and I'm going to write back to MOPS fall off. So I'm just up, all this is doing essentially is updating the fall off animation that we did in SOPS into DOPS because uh, again, in DOPS, you're only setting initial conditions. Uh, if you want to read animation from a SOPS timeline and have that apply to DOPS, you have to update the DOPS uh, geometry to match. And that's what fetch attribute does. It just makes this simpler so that you don't have to write VEX to do it. The last thing here that's very important is you have match by attribute enabled here. Uh, and the attribute to match is ID. And this goes back to what I was talking about, about constraint order being scrambled. This makes sure that we're reading the right falloff value from the right primitive, even though the vellum solver uh, could be and probably is scrambling the constraint order. You don't have to go through this step if you're using vellum in a traditional dot net, if you're like setting up the vellum object yourself from scratch, but because most of you aren't doing that, uh, it's important to know this workaround and, and be aware of it because otherwise uh, when you fetch these values, they'd be writing to different uh, primitives and you get a much different shape than you'd expect. So now that I have this falloff attribute, the next step is to uh, drop down a vellum constraint property dot. And we really don't need to do anything here other than to make sure that we're affecting the stretch constraint. We want to affect rest length scale using this. Um, and again, if you hover over this, you can see that the parameter is named rest scale. That means that we can, if we're using a expression, we can write to the local variable rest scale, which means we're not using an at symbol. We're not binding to it. We're just going to say rest scale is equal to mops fall off the attribute that we wrote. And that's all we have to do. Um, we could in theory do a little bit of extra work probably to, uh, directly have mops fall off right to the exact value that we want and then skip this. But this is, again, because of this is like a scaling operation, this is a much easier way to think about it. We have a fall off attribute, it goes between one and three, uh, and then we drop down vellum constraint property and just say scale equals whatever that value is between one and three. 
And now that we have this written out, uh, I'm just going to uh, run this sim. Uh, I have this already cached to disk, so just give me one second. Okay, so this is all cached and ready to go, and let me just play through the sim. So you can see that this sort of weird inflation pattern starts from the bottom and then works its way up to the top of the shape. Let's just watch that again. It's a really weird effect, and you can do some kinds of interesting inflation, organic growth effects this way, uh, as long as you have enough source geometry uh, to warrant the kind of expansion that you're doing. If you're doing very low-resolution geometry, you're going to have a hard time getting this kind of detail. Um, but this actually seemed pretty quick. You know, I'm using a, a relatively old machine, uh, and it took you know maybe two minutes to do to do this uh, five seconds sim. So now that this is done, what I'm going to do is um, I'm taking the uh, fall off from this geo that I transferred across uh, and just transferring it to the simulated geometry, and then I'm blurring it and then running it through a color modifier. Um, the blur here, let me just disable this so you can see what's going on. So these are the raw values um, of the fall off mapped to this kind of purple and white gradient as the expansion happens. So you can kind of use this as almost a visualizer. We're seeing where the constraint lengths are super high uh, and where they're growing. And you can see in the in the low areas, we're not uh, where it's dark purple, we're not getting any growth at all. We're not getting this like weird coral pattern. Um, so this is just like you know, you could use this uh, as the color itself if that's like how you want to art direct it. Uh, you could use it as a visualizer. Let me re-enable this blur so you can see what that's doing. It's just softening some of these edges here. The other thing that you could do with this fall off because you have it is if you, for example, wanted to blend between materials, like if uh, you wanted it to be one material here and then in these areas where it's inflating, if you wanted it to look like it was getting stretched out or like it was a, a membrane that was thinning out, you could use this as a mask for materials. So you could blend one or multiple materials together using this fall off value in a shading network. Um, so again, th there's a lot of things that you can do with an effect like this, but uh, it's just another use case for the MOPS fall off nodes. They make really handy masks for things like that. You could even just bind these directly, uh, these values directly to like a single attribute on a material if you wanted this to affect you know, for example, the roughness or the color or anything like that. So again, not that many nodes uh, all said and done. We did most of the hard work in SOPs and then it was just like two quick DOP nodes and we get this kind of really bizarre effect. The only other thing I wanted to point out in the Vellum Solver that I didn't mention before is that in order to get this thing, because um, this inflation effect uh, can be, this inflation effect can introduce a lot of energy into the simulation um, when these rest lengths uh, expand. Um, it's possible for the object to get pulled around in different directions or to oscillate pretty rapidly. And so on the Vellum Solver, I set the velocity damping to 0.2. And that kind of makes the simulation almost act more like Vellum Brush, uh, if you've ever used that node where you can kind of grab things and move them around and the whole thing kind of slows down and drags almost like it's underwater. That's essentially what this is doing. It's a little bit like drag, but it has the effect of kind of reducing um, energy that's injected into the sim due to messing around with constraint attributes. So if you're trying to go for this, you know, not physically accurate kind of like, you know, otherworldly abstract effect, this can be a useful way of preventing your sim from going out of control when you're doing these kinds of things. Next up, we're going to take a look at pressure constraints. Pressure is weird because the constraints are one single giant primitive that winds around each shell. You can't target constraint attributes like stiffness or rest length in the same way you can with other constraints because of this. There's some special attributes that you can modify to make this effect, though, with just a little extra work. Okay, so here's our pressure example. Again, uh, this file is already built for you, and I'm just going to step through this in the interest of time so you don't have to sit here and watch me build this whole network from scratch. Um, but I'm going to step through it with you really quickly so you at least understand sort of how this is working. So this file is vellumpressure.hip and it's included as one of the examples for MOPS Plus um, if you have a newer version. So what I'm doing here essentially is I'm making these like cheesy little air mattresses for this pressure demo. Uh, I'm starting with a circle and then just copying it to make sort of the silhouette of this thing. I'm running a Boolean operation and that's um, set to uh, treat it as a surface, not as a volume because these are flat objects. Uh, and I have this set to union. So it's essentially joining all these shapes and then a divide sop uh, set to remove shared edges is going to pull those inside edges out. Uh, so now I have somewhat cleaner topology. You can see the difference here when I turn on points. Uh, it's basically one single shape now without the internal geometry. Uh, 
I'm going to turn that into a planar patch. Uh, so planar patch from curves with resample enabled and interior edge length here means that I'm going to get this kind of regular uh, triangulated pattern, which is perfect for vellum cloth. I extrude it. So now I have like the rough uh, mattress shape and then run this through an attribute blur to kind of soften it up a bit um, because I don't want these things to look too rigid. And then again at the end, because now um, because of this extrusion and everything, uh, my topology is really irregular here. I have all these big long quads in the middle here. I'm just going to run it through one final remesh um, with a target size of 0 0.02. And so now I have a mostly regular triangulation for this object, which is what we want for a vellum sim. The next thing to do is uh, to run this through vellum cloth. Um, the only thing that I changed here is I made sure that the stretch stiffness is pretty high. Um, when you do a default vellum sim, it's not always this value. I'm doing this uh, as 6 uh, times 10 to the 7th uh, for the stretch stiffness. And the reason for this is that if I want the inflation effect to really look right, if the object is too stretchy, um, it's just going to sort of blob outwards because the the fabric, the, you know, the, the stretch constraints are so loose that it has room to kind of just blob out in different directions. And I want this to look like it's under some amount of pressure. So that stiffness needs to be a little bit higher for this. The bend stiffness though, I'm turning pretty far down um, because I want it to kind of just turn to mush when it's deflated. Um, again, these values can be kind of scale dependent. It's situational depending on what your SIM. These are the values that I found worked for the SIM. Different ones might work for you, but uh, I just want to point out my logic here about why the constraints are doing what they're doing. The next thing I'm going to do is set up a vellum pressure constraint. Uh, so before we go any further here, I'm just going to drop down a null and I'm going to wire it to the constraints here so you can see what the actual constraint primitives look like. So if I zoom in here, these are the bend constraints and stretch constraints that are created by the vellum constraints node. Um, and this may be a little bit hard to see. I'm going to turn on primitive numbers here, but you can see that basically each one of these segments here is its own primitive. Uh, and I realize that, that this is kind of blinding. It's, it's hard to get a sense of what this is, but that's what's happening is each of these little uh, segments here is a constraint. Now I'm going to drop down my pressure constraint here. And you can see that it made this sort of big mess of scribbly lines, which is what every constraint looks like, right? I'm just going to drop this null down here again and visualize this, and it really doesn't look that much different. But what I want to show you here is if I delete all other constraints but this pressure constraint, I'm going to do that by just saying group equals stretch and then delete non-selected. Sorry, I didn't mean stretch. What I want to do is the pressure constraint. So I'm going to just switch this out to pressure instead. Okay, so now what you can see here is you get this big, crazy, scribbly mess. But the really important thing here, and again, this is one of many reasons why I say that you should always, always have the spreadsheet open. It's just so important to understanding how Houdini works and debugging what you're doing. But notice how there's only one single pressure constraint. There's one primitive. Um, the reason that this is important is because in the other examples that we've done when we've been messing around with like the stiffness or the rest length of constraints, that attribute is modified per primitive, right? It's a primitive attribute on the constraint that we're setting in order to make individual areas grow or shrink or pin or whatever it is that we're doing. In the case of a pressure constraint specifically, we no longer have that option because a, cons a pressure constraint is literally one giant squiggly primitive that kind of zooms around the entire surface of the object. So we can't use the same tricks we were using before. We're going to have to look at this a little bit differently. Um, we'll get there in a second. I just want to explain to you why this method is different and why pressure constraints are so weird. So the next thing I'm going to do here, and this is because I want to make multiple copies of this, um, I'm going to use vellum pack. And what this lets me do is treat the geometry and the constraints in it and all of their relationships as a single object. And this is really great for if I if I already know that my constraints are set up, if like, you know, I know that this object is where I want it to be, um, I can make multiple copies of it or move it in space and not have to recompute the constraints. Um, because if I just ran a transform SOP on the geometry and the constraints themselves, uh, it, it would not work. And if I just, if I decided, oh, this is where I want this thing to be, and I started uh, a transform upstream here after this remesh, I would have to recompute these constraints every single time I moved it, and that can get really slow. 
So villain pack is a great way around that. I can pack this and then I can run transforms, I can run copies, I can do whatever I want uh, and it's gonna work. So now that I've packed it, I'm going to just copy it twice. This is just a simple copy transform. So now I have four of these little uh, inflatable mattresses. And then I'm gonna run a match size just to line them up around the origin so everything is centered and nice. Match size is an amazing node. I use it all the time. Uh, and now when I run Vellum Unpack, you can see that all of these guys are here. And if I just, again, if I just drag this down so you can see the constraints, um, all of these guys are set up with their bend constraints intact and the pressure constraint intact. So they're, that's the sort of the amazing thing about Pack and Unpack with Vellum. Uh, is that I can manipulate that whole geometry stream with all the constraints included as a single piece, which is just great. Uh, I'm gonna delete this. Okay, so let's go to the constraint configuration first because that's what we're most uh, familiar with. As always, if we're gonna be animating anything about constraints in Vellum and we need to be updating from SOPs, it's important to say to give it an ID attribute because the constraint order is gonna get scrambled. So enumerate SOP uh, on primitives. I'm just creating the ID attribute and now my primitives have an ID. Um, the next thing that I'm doing here is, and this might be easier if I just go, I'm gonna just jump over to the geometry side first because this shape fall off here is a copy of this one. They're doing the same movement. So with preview fall off on, I've created this shape fall off node and Again, I'm just doing a really simple sweep across. So uh, what this is visualizing is going from low pressure or no pressure to high pressure. And it's just going to be this simple sweep. And you can see that I'm writing to an attribute uh, called pressure scale. This is important. Um, pressure scale is, uh, is actually an attribute that Vellum understands, but I'm gonna explain more about this uh, in a second. So anyways, this is the important part. I'm sort of sweeping across from here to here. And this shape fall off here is a reference copy of the exact same one. I'm writing again from here to here and you can see how it kind of sweeps across the constraints. Um, an important thing that I'm doing here is on this fall off, I'm only writing to the pressure constraint. I don't want to affect the bend stiffness here. I could be, and it, it might be fine if I did that, but for the purposes of this demo, uh, I only want to change the pressure constraint. And the attribute that I'm writing to in this case is rest length scale. Um, I wanna point out right now that uh, as we showed in previous examples, rest length scale is not a real attribute. We have rest length and we have rest length a ridge. This is just some name I made up for convenience. Um, it's not actually gonna directly affect the sim unless we do something with it in DOPS. Okay, and finally, I'm promoting rest length scale from a point to a primitive attribute. Um, just so that we can see what this looks like only on my um, pressure constraint, because that's the only one that we're gonna be affecting in DOPS. I'm just gonna put down the, this blast again. I'm going to blast everything but the pressure constraint. And as we sweep across, you can see that the rest length scale is going to uh, slowly crank up. You can kind of ignore the, the color on here because that's being applied per point. That's not what got promoted. I just wanna show you that as we sweep the timeline across, this is the average fall off, like from that original fall off, what we're doing is we're taking the average across the entire pressure constraint and setting that to the rest length scale. The reason that we're doing this is that we want the rest length of the pressure constraint to change to reflect the volume that we want these things to be as they inflate. So here we want the volume to be very low. We want that pressure uh, constraint to be minimal, like the, the scale is zero, so the pressure constraint has no effect. And then when the thing has the fall off fully across, we want that rest length scale to be one, which means enforce the original pressure constraint as we have it uh, designed. Um, going back to the geometry here in a second, because uh, I just want to show you like, we're only modifying four constraints here, right? And it's just the average of this, of this color value that we're seeing sweeping across. When we go back to pressure scale here, um, I want to point out that this is a point attribute that is on the geometry. So as we sweep this across here, you can see that the pressure scale is a point attribute on the geometry itself. When you're working with pressure constraints, um, if you look at the rest length scale attribute here on these four primitives, you can see that you don't have per point control. You don't have granular control over uh, where those pressure constraints are starting to inflate from, right? If we just ran this sim by itself and we didn't write to pressure scale here, uh, and we were just going by 
um, the values of the constraints here on this node, so just these four. We would be able to inflate each one of these mattresses one at a time, but we wouldn't be able to say, hey, we want it to inflate from the left side to the right, because there are just four constraints here, and this is the only attribute that we have. So pressure scale, which is a separate attribute that Vellum, the Vellum solver understands, which again, really important, is on the geometry, on the points of the geometry, not the constraints. This is one of the weird things about pressure. What this is going to do is apply the pressure uh, on a point-by-point -point basis based on this attribute value. The reason that we're doing both of these things uh, is because if we left the rest length scale at full and then we had a really strong pressure gradient, so we're, like, we're not enforcing it on one side but we are on the other, you're going to get sort of more unstable or more weird behavior because the pressure constraint still wants to keep each of these shapes at the, at the full volume that we've defined for it based on the rest length of the pressure constraints. Um, but if all of these things are set to zero, what we're going to get is like, you know, the right side or whatever side is inflated first is going to overinflate and get huge and go unstable and fly off in different directions. If we make these changes to both the overall volume of each of these air mattresses, which is what we're doing on this side by doing this average promotion, and we have the pressure scale in here, this is what it's going to get us this inflation effect from left to right. Okay, so enough theory. Let's go into the solver and see what's looking up inside here. So first of all, we have this fetch attribute that's grabbing pressure scale, and this is initialized to geometry. Um, again, the inputs I'm fetching from the, the geo null that we defined in SOPS, uh, and all this is doing is just importing that pressure scale attribute animation that we did. Uh, I'm not doing anything else fancy here. We're just updating pressure scale on our geometry points as the simulation runs. Now I'm doing another fetch attribute, and this time, uh, I, you can see that this is set to initialize geometry, but I typed in these values manually. This is running over constraints, so I can just set this to constraints and nothing's gonna change. Uh, the input tab, the destination geometry is constraint geometry. That's the data name for vellum constraints. Um, and the source here is again pointed to a SOP path. This is my constraints null that's going into the vellum solver here. The attribute though is this rest length scale attribute that I created. And again, vellum does not know what this means. So we're going to have to define what this means uh, in the simulation after this is done. And I have match by attribute enabled because again, this is constraints. Um, you can't trust the primitive order of constraints in a, in, when using the vellum solver SOP. So I have this enabled. That's why I did the enumerate uh, right at the beginning of the constraints here. The next step is, again, a vellum constraint property dot. Um, and I have this isolated to just the pressure group, so this is the only thing that I'm changing. And I'm taking this fetched rest length scale attribute that computed, this is again the average uh, for each of these mattresses, and I'm writing that directly to rest length scale. So the rest scale local variable here is uh, reading from this rest length scale animation that I did in SOPS and just writing that directly to the scale. So going back here, the last thing that I'm doing here is just copying this color attribute across as a visualizer so you can see what the pressure is actually doing. Uh, and now let's just cook this in really quick. Okay, simulation took a minute to run. And now you can see that they deflate immediately as soon as uh, the simulation starts because again, pressure scale and the length of the pressure constraint is zero at the beginning. So they just sink into nothing. And then as that sweeps across, the pressure scale updates from left to right, which is how you get these things inflating from one side to the other. And then the pressure, the rest length of the pressure constraints also scales up according to the average. Um, you can see that there's still a little bit of looseness left. And what we could do is potentially remap the pressure scale here. So like instead of using this as it is, we could remap this to a wider value. So maybe instead of zero to one, it's going to like zero to 1.5 or zero to two. You can play with those values uh, to try and see kind of how it affects the pressure uh, simulation and how it how it looks overall. The pressure is a little finicky to work with. Um, and before I wrap up this section, I just want to point out um, as an example, if we went into the vellum solver here and all we were doing was adjusting pressure scale and not changing the rest length of the constraints, I'm just gonna cook this in once uh, without changing the rest length scale of the, the 
volume constraint primitives to show you kind of what that looks like. So uh, I'm going to disable this and then run the sim one more time just to show you why you need to do both. Okay, so really quickly, just to clarify, um, I also had to disable the vellum constraint property here uh, so that we're not overwriting rest length scale. So now the pressure constraint uh, length is not changing. So these things are going to try and maintain a consistent volume of the fully inflated volume, um, even though these things are fully deflated because the pressure scale of each of these points is zero. So you can see that as this plays across, it works fine, but then <laughs> look how, fastly, how fast they get sucked out. And what's happening is as soon as the pressure scale of these points goes above zero, um, for these points and the points next to it, it's trying to enforce the entire fully inflated uh, volume of each of these things on just a few points on one side of the object. So we're injecting a ton of energy into just these points uh, and they go launching off into the sunset. And you're gonna see the same thing happen to these guys. They inflate, they're trying to enforce all of that pressure from the entire, uh, each one of these mattresses in just this one section and it just goes completely crazy. So that's why we have to do this kind of twice if we're going to do these effect. We need to change the pressure scale so that per point, each of these things are inflating from start to finish in the pattern that we want so that we can choose which ones get in, which sides get inflated first. And we need to change the rest length of each pressure constraint to some overall average value so that uh, the overall volume of each of these things is, uh, is consistent with how inflated we want it to appear, if that makes sense. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated work. Pressure constraints are weird. Uh, it's unfortunately how it is, but once you get used to how this workflow works, um, fine tuning the inflated look of these things really just goes back to the values of the rest length scale. So if we want these to be stiffer uh, on the output, we can rewind this. I'm gonna just break this um, link here. Let's just delete this channel, enable fit. Uh, and then I'm gonna just delete these two, my output channels. And let's just say the minimum is, let's just set it to zero flat and then the maximum, maybe it could be two. And so now these things are going to be under quite a lot of pressure when they're fully inflated. I'm just gonna run this sim one more time so that you can see how this looks. Again, for this, I'm uh, enabling both of these so that we're doing the full uh, rest length adjustment now on the pressure constraints. Okay, that sim's cooked. Let's hit play and it starts off the same, but now you can see that these things are practically rigid once they're fully inflated. And you can see that uh, because they're under so much more pressure, there's a lot of energy uh, that gets pushed into the simulation because these constraints, the bend constraints, are under a lot of stress now. And so they, they kind of shoot up because they're getting inflated so fast. Um, so these numbers you know, can take a little bit of fine tuning to get the look right, but uh, this is basically the kind of thing that you would play with in order to adjust this sim, how it feels. You would change the rest length of this pressure constraint. Maybe you'd go back and change how, uh, how bendy or how stiff the bends are or how stiff the uh, stretches are in order to get exactly the look that you want. Just to drive the point home, if you're going to be messing with pressure and you want to be able to do it on a per point basis, it's important that you're changing the pressure scale attribute on the geometry on the points and you're changing the rest length of the pressure constraints uh, on the primitives in your pressure constraints specifically. You have to do both. The last example is a little different. So far, we've just been messing around with constraint attributes, but it's possible to use other MOPS tools to generate forces that affect vellum. In this example, we use MOPS falloffs and MOPS plus apply attributes to drive an attraction force that pulls a vellum fluid onto a surface. Okay, for the last example, again, there's a bit of SOP work uh, up front that I don't want to like step through uh, too much. So I've set up most of this thing for you. Um, this is in the examples folder. This is called vellumforce.hip. Um, what I'm starting with is just the template head. Um, I'm blasting out the mouth bag group. That's some geometry on the inside of this guy that uh, is if you actually wanted to rig this guy to speak, you have this bag inside so that you don't see the back of the head when you're rendering. Um, I'm then running a polyfill. This is just capping the, the bottom of this thing so I can turn it into a, a volume effectively. Um, and then I'm running a shape fall off. Uh, and this is just a simple vertical shape fall off with some noise applied to it. It's pretty high frequency given uh, the scale of this head. Uh, and if I animate this across, you can see it's animating pretty slowly. 
uh, up the length of the head. And what I'm going to do is, and you might already see this hint because I have this template flag on. Let me just disable this really quick so you're not distracted by it. So I have this animation going up over the length of the head. And what this is going to do is reveal the head geometry as a goal for the particles um, as it travels up. Um, because I'm going to be using apply attributes to sort of suction the vellum fluid particles onto the head. And the particles, are, the particles are going to be looking for the nearest available surface. And we're revealing that surface over time. The way that we're going to do that reveal is by using mops clip by attribute, which is a neat little tool that I added, you know, not that long ago. Um, but this uses one of my favorite tricks uh, to smoothly clip geometry based on an attribute value. Um, if you're curious about how it works, it's kind of mind-bending. Uh, you should dive inside and look. It's a really neat trick that someone taught me a long time ago, uh, and I, I use it all the time now. Um, so what I have this doing is on clip by attribute, I have the attribute, as always, set to mops falloff, and the clip value is 0.5, and the clip direction is less than. What this means is that any primitives here, or any points that have a value of uh, mops falloff value of less than 0.5 are going to get clipped. Uh, and the particularly interesting um, way that this thing works is that that clip is going to be smooth over time. So we're not going to be like blasting points and getting a jittery surface. It's going to smoothly clip it over time uh, as it evolves. So this is our target geometry smoothly animating on over time. And this is what we're going to attract those points to. So I'm just going to template this so that we have it back uh, the way it was before. Now I'm making a box. It's wide and shallow. Um, this is sort of the basis for the fluid. I use a vellum fluid SOP to basically do the initial configuration. Packing density is pretty high. The particle size is pretty low. Um, it, this is just packing that box full of uh, vellum fluid particles. The next thing that I'm going to do is I want to use another fall off to sort of decide when these points are going to actually be activated, like basically how much force I'm going to apply. Um, and that's again another easy fall off. And this is really this is just a shape fall off in spherical mode. If I activate the uh, handle here, you can see it's scaling up over time, and it's it's fairly loose. I'm not use I don't want to use like a terribly high value, or else these points are going to snap right into position. Because the way that mops forces works uh, is that if you're using apply attributes um, and you apply a fall off of a hundred percent. Uh, with all their sliders at default, it's going to try and force that particle to its goal, which in this case is the surface of the head, in a single time step. And we don't want that. We want this to be like a nice, slow, gradual move. Uh, so that's why we have this nice broad gradient. And then after this expands at the end, what I'm doing is uh, increasing the inner radius a little bit more rapidly to just act as like a cleanup pass to sort of finish up so that all of these things uh, stiffen up uh, and try to stick at their goals towards the end of the sim. Uh, so I just want to explain that animation a little bit because this, um, depending on how your individual simulation is set up, this could take some finessing to get right to make sure that you have the forces uh, blending as smoothly as possible. Anyways, let's actually d dive into the vellum sim now. So I'm going to go inside here. And not too complicated in here. There's not, mu not that much going on. We're starting with a fetch attribute, uh, and this is on the geometry we're grabbing, again, from the vellum points here, the inputs tab is really important to pay attention to uh, with this node. We're grabbing the fall off value, the animated fall off from uh, SOPs and applying it to DOPs. So this is going to be our fall off for the amount of force that we're applying. Now, if we go to apply attributes, um, and again, a lot of you, if you've used uh, mops plus before, you're probably used to mops apply attributes dop as being something that you use to like make rigid bodies move towards goal points or something, um, which is great, but it also can apply to anything that's point-based. Uh, that could be particles, it could be vellum grains, it could be vellum fluids, it's whatever you want. Um, but there's a couple extra little gotchas that we need to worry about here because we aren't dealing with packed primitives, we're not dealing with bullet primitives. First of all, under transformation, um, we're going to disable scale. Uh, we could also disable rotate. We really don't need to worry about updating orientation here because these these are just fluid particles. Like We don't care what the orientation is. But we definitely don't want to apply scale. Uh, and that's because if we go to the geometry here um, of our vellum points, you can see that our points um, already have a scale applied to them. We look over here, our p-scale is 0 
And what's going to happen if we leave this enabled is the target geometry, so the head, when a point decides like, oh, hey, I want to go, you know, I want to go to that surface, that's my new target. If this is enabled, it's going to read the scale from that target and the target has no scale, so it's gonna to default to one. So if this were on, these points would would grow to about a hundred times or you know more than a hundred times their current size, uh, which would be bad. So we're gonna turn this off because all we wanna do is affect the position of these things. Um, the second thing that we're gonna do here, and this is a relatively new mode for apply attributes. We're gonna set this from the default, which is usually ID. Uh, we're going to match by nearest point on surface. And what that means is that when these things are looking for a goal to attract to, they're going to look for the nearest point on that head, you know, whatever we have here is our input for the target geometry, and then try to, to goal to that location. Uh, the next thing uh, to look at here is under force update. Uh, my translate force multiplier, this is something that you're going to have to sort of spend a little bit of time tweaking. You can kind of think of this as a multiplier on the fall off that we already set. So we're going to turn this down so that these things don't pull quite so hard to the goal once the fall off is activated. The only other thing I did here is I just increased the air resistance because I want them to follow the goal reasonably closely. I want them to get pulled quickly, but not get pulled uh, with too much force, if that makes sense. Um, and then I just have a pop wind here after the fact. Um, essentially what this is doing is applying a very slight upward force to points that um, are already told to turn on. So basically it's gonna suction things upwards a little bit and encourage them to move up towards the top of the head, but it's only gonna affect points that already actually have force applied to them. So these blue points here that haven't been activated yet aren't going to start moving up yet. That's what this expression is doing. Um, again, this is just to make sure that the, the fluid gets kind of sucked upwards and is encouraged to cover the entire head rather than stick to the nearest surface and then just stop there. So let's cook this in. I'm just gonna hit play, and zoom out a bit so that we can see it a little bit more clearly as the head grows. And let's just cook this. Okay, that's done running and let's watch it play. You can see that as the surface grows, the fluid particles are attracted to it. And then uh, our wind force helps push things upwards a little bit so that they're encouraged to cover the rest of the surface as they move up. Um, and thanks to how vellum fluids work as far as how they solve surface tension, the goal force that's sort of encouraging these things to stick is being counterbalanced by the surface tension and the the innate um, repulsion that these things have to each other. They're trying to maintain a certain distance from each other and spread out a bit. So by the end of the sim, these things uh, cover the head in a pretty stable pattern. Let's watch it one more time. So it's not perfect. Uh, clearly there would need to be some work in getting this to um, grow exactly the way you'd want it to. Maybe you would want a force to kind of contain them in so that they're gonna crawl up along the neck instead of shooting up like this. Um, it'd take from some finesse, but uh, the important part is just show you a few different ways that you can use uh, MOPS nodes, including some unexpected ones, to manipulate forces on anything. It's not just about constraints. It's not just about rigid bodies. You can do this on points too. Uh, last thing for the sim, just because I have it here uh, to walk you through it, is this is just a pretty standard VDB meshing scheme. I'm creating a VDB from these particles with a pretty small voxel size based on the original point radius. I'm uh, dilating the VDB to kind of expand it a bit. This is like a classic trick. You dilate, you run a smooth operation. I'm using Laplacian flow with a pretty high number of iterations. Um, I like the way that this operator works. It's not quite as brute force uh, as the, the Gaussian or the mean. Um, then I undo that dilate that I did earlier with a, an erode in the, uh, with the same value. Uh, and that dilate smooth erode basically allows you to get um, smoother blends between uh, convex areas. You'll get like a smoother seam here without losing uh, detail or like getting as many choppy bits. This is still not a great mesh. You can see there's lumps all over it. If you wanted to do this for a final sim, you would probably need many, many more particles and it would take a long time, but uh, we don't have all day. So it's lumpy. Uh, there are other ways that you could filter it, but generally speaking, you would have to final this with many more particles than we're using here. And then just to convert VDB back to polygons at the end, or a polygon soup, which is a little bit more efficient. And that's it for this tutorial. Uh, I hope that 
this was helpful for you. I know a lot of people have been asking specifically about vellum and how to do things like inflations and how to change constraints and uh, why their tricks weren't working with pressure. Um, and so I just wanted to give sort of a broad uh, overview of the different ways that you can use these tools with vellum specifically, because it's a very cool solver. I love that Houdini added it. It's some of the most fun stuff that you can do in the program right now, in my opinion, um, but it does take a little bit of know-how. And if you haven't already done the Vellum Masterclass with John Lynch, uh, it's a long one, but I can't recommend it enough if you want to really understand the guts of what Vellum is doing under the hood. Thanks for watching and see you again soon.